Hello, everyone. First, I would like to thank the International Ultraviolet Association and the UNESCO's Institute for Water Education for giving me this great opportunity to present the work that we have done uh, through a collaboration between the University of California in Berkeley, where I uh, am finishing my PhD, and also Fundación Cantar Azul, which is a nonprofit organization based in Mexico. So this uh, collaboration that combines the research objectives of a university with the, you know, with the practice goals of an organization on the ground has been very effective in developing innovations in a series of areas in, in, how, in water treatment, uh, including the design of the first UV disinfection system that was developed specifically for uh, rural households in developing countries. Uh, but also we have worked on uh, water treatment at schools using ultraviolet light, and also we are developing now a social franchise that uh, utilizes kiosks that use UV disinfection to provide safe drink drinking water in different areas. Uh, also, the collaboration with the University of California has uh, helped Cantaro Sul to evaluate very rigorously the programs that it implements, and, and that has helped uh, strengthen the work that, that we do, and also has, in some cases, questioned what we're doing and uh, help us move into a course that is, seems to be more effective. Um, but today I will focus mostly on the work that we do at uh, the household level. So I will provide first the context and motivation for UV disinfection in rural households. And then uh, we'll describe the process that we follow to develop the, the system. And then we'll move into the results of our field efficacy and also the adoption and use uh, results of, our, of the evaluation that we carried out. And finally, uh, I will share some of, the, uh, some of the conclusions that we have reached throughout this time. So we started working 10 years ago in, in rural Mexico, and especially in the Baja California Peninsula. And, and, these, uh, and the communities where we worked uh, initially uh, are, are spread out and the, the density of, of people is very low. Uh, they have very limited infrastructure. Only about 10% of the households are connected to the electrical grid. However, most of the rest uh, have solar panels that have been promoted by the government. And, uh, you know, you know, and also other examples of the infrastructure that is lacking is that you know, most of these communities, you need to reach them by driving two hours in a dirt road. And, and, and so, it's, so these are hard places and they're very distributed. It's very hard to have a pipe distribution system that would you know, be in place in these areas. Um, as most arid regions, you know, these families are relying on shallow wells and, and, and springs to meet their domestic and drinking water needs. Then they transport the water from these sources into the household through different mechanisms. Some do that by carrying water in buckets. Others have uh, developed gravity, improvised gravity-fed systems, and others even truck the water to the homes. And, and once the water gets at, ho at home, um, they usually store drinking water in clay or rock uh, pots, uh, but they also store water in buckets and 200-liter barrels. And so what we found early on was that, uh, as you know, most of you may know, like water uh, was contaminated at the source because it's not protected, and so you have sometimes latrines that are installed next to a well. You also have a runoff that occurs, and, and sometimes also just the settling of the dust or, or the cattle coming in and drinking from that water. But the contamination, when measured uh, with a fecal indicator like E. coli, uh, seemed to increase as the water was transported to the home and then managed uh, and stored in, in containers uh, that usually, you know, require people dipping, um, dipping a cup in it, uh, which is likely to be one of the causes of, of the contamination at the home. And so in, specifically in this area of Mexico, uh, over the past 20 years, child mortality due to gastrointestinal illness decreased, mainly because of the introduction of oral rehydration therapy, but gastrointestinal illness did not, did not decrease, like the, and, and it's the second cause of, of disease in the region. And so the health ministry has been, promoted for, has been promoting for more than 15 years the use of bleach at home and also boiling. And, but I have interviewed in that area about 300 to 400 families and met only one person that was using bleach every day to, uh, to disinfect her water and, and maybe a handful that, that really uh, have evidence of boiling water on a daily basis. So, so they didn't seem to be like, like good solutions for this region. And and another thing that, that we found while we were doing this work was that people uh, in, in this area, they, you know, they, 
they care about water quality, but that's not the only dimension that they use to value water. They also, for example, in this case, you see this woman that has this clay pot, and this clay pot was given to her by her mother 20, 30 years ago, and, and she's very proud to have it, and she displays it in an important place in her house, and everyone that comes to visit her, you know, she takes them to the clay pot and tells a story about it. And, and so, um, so what we started learning was that people value water also through cultural dimensions. And if we, and another, another dimension that was important, you can see how uh, the clay pot shines in here, and that's because it has water. So the clay lets some of the water out, and once it's in the surface, it evaporates, and by evaporative cooling, it brings the temperature of the water uh, down. So even in a very hot day, she can drink, without having a refrigerator, she can drink water that is, that is uh, fresh. And, and so that also provides an aesthetic value to the water. And, and so we realized that it was really important to, when designing a product or a technology, it was really important to take into consideration also these other dimensions of value that people have. And that has really driven some of the work that we have done. So, uh, so as I mentioned, as part of this collaboration, uh, we, uh, we had some practice goals, and they were to develop an effective, low-cost, and user-friendly system, but also ultraviolet system, but also one that consider these aesthetic and, and, and uh, these aesthetic dimensions. And also to formulate an implementation program that would support the adoption and sustained use of the technology. And from the research perspective, uh, we, I mean, ultraviolet disinfection is a very mature technology, and we know that it works in central, centralized systems and also in point of view systems in developing countries, in developed countries. But prior to our study, there hadn't been any rigorous studies of UV disinfection in, at the household level in rural areas. So it was really an important research question to, you know, to understand if, if they could be effective. And, and also, a lot of point of use water systems, uh, although they offer uh, many advantages and they can be very effective, uh, many of these systems are also lead to very low adoption and sustained use. So it was important to try to understand if the, by, by addressing some of the barriers of chlorine, for example, the, the bad taste that it can create, or boiling, you know, all the time that it takes or all the resources that need to be invested, if by addressing this type of barriers, if ultraviolet disinfection could actually lead to higher adoption and sustained use. So uh, I will describe first some of the work that we did in designing the system. And you know, this is the latest version that we have. And uh, from the technical perspective, it's important to note that in comparison to most other commercially available systems, the lamp is above the water. So you can see how the lamp sits here. And that's important because we don't require a quartz leaf, which can be expensive. And also, we don't have a fouling problem because the, the lamp is not in contact with the water. And, um, and yes, and uh, the system delivers a very fast flow rate, five liters per minute. It allows a family to uh, produce all the water that they need for drinking purposes in less than five minutes. Uh, it's easy to use and does not change the taste of the water. Uh, but it does require electricity. However, most of the systems that we have implemented are connected to solar panels and consume less than 20 watts. And, and it's important you know, that water must be clean in the sense of the, the absorbance must be low or the transmittance has to be high. And it's also important to introduce a safe storage container. In this case, our safe storage container also has this denim cloth that, that, you, that is used to wrap it. And what users do is that they wet the denim cloth in the morning and by evaporative cooling, it also keeps the temperature of the, of the water cold. And that was very important to uh, increase sustained use in our earlier studies. Um, uh, the way that, the, the, so this system is called the Mesita Azul, and that stands for Little Blue Table in Spanish. And the way that this, work, this works is that first, users have to flip a switch, and the switch is usually here in the back. You can see it very well from here. And then there's a window that they can check that the lamp is working. And, and then if they check that the lamp is working, then they pour water into the bucket, and they open the, the valve that is in here, and then just water flows by gravity, and they can continue doing their work, and then come back five minutes later, and the 20 liters will be in this container, and then they can move the container to wherever they need it in the house. Um, I use uh, units of UV dose in joules per meter square, but this would be equivalent to 120 uh, milli joules per centimeter square, if I'm, is that, am I right? I'm not, yes, okay. So, so one important thing in designing the UV chamber of the system was to create um, this safety margin. So we're delivering a dose that is three times higher than uh, most, you know, what is usually recommended. 
And that's because we recognize that if our users are going to be people in houses, there, you know, we have to design a system that is still going to deliver an effective dose, even if they don't uh, meet certain instructions, like replacing a lamp every year or so, or every number of hours. Uh, so our system, uh, even at the end of the, li the life of the lamp, the lamp is still delivering a very high dose. And, and this is kind of, again, recognizing that the system is going to be operated in non-ideal conditions. Sometimes absorbance might be higher, uh, or, or there could be other issues as well. But, but we are, you know, one of the benefits of UV disinfection is that we can overdose without creating any, um, any hazards. Um, there's, you know, the, dog, the World Health Organization recently published uh, some guidelines for household water treatment. And, and I recommend uh, you to take a look at them. And the, the current dose that we deliver meets the highly protective target of these standards. And also, uh, in, in addition to designing the system, we also created a program that has a series of activities that start with a need as needs assessment. The needs assessment is important not only to understand if there's demand and need for the system, but also to measure water quality in these communities. Because in some communities, there might be arsenic or other problems that are not dealt with UV disinfection, and we don't want to be uh, promoting this as a solution where it's not a solution. Um, also, uh, it, has an it has an activity with the community where uh, there are, uh, there's a presentation about the relation between health and water, uh, uh, different options that people can have to treat their water, and the Mesita Sul is introduced as one of these alternatives. And people enroll in that into the program in this presentation. They pay a fee to participate in the program, although some costs are subsidized. And then there's the installation of the technology in each of the households to identify where's the right place to locate it and also to train the, the people in the house to operate the system. We usually spend 30 to 40 minutes uh, doing, doing that training. And we also train local technicians to provide more uh, in-depth ma maintenance and repairs. And then we do follow-ups mostly with the technicians and with houses that are having problems. So this didn't occur overnight. There, there was a, a long process of, uh, you know, from, from developing a prototype and then installing 24 of these systems, you can see that the initial design was more, um, it, had, it responded more to utilitarian values, meaning like it, it was as simple as possible, focusing mostly on producing good quality water, but then it moved into something that could be more aesthetically pleasing, including this uh, part to, to keep down, the temp to, to lower the temperature of the water, and then finally into the latest version of the Mesita Sun. And I, in the, uh, in the panel later on, I can talk more about the process of design if you're interested. And then moving into the results of the field efficacy evaluation, we, you know, for our research question, the way that we proceeded was first to ask, you know, do households gain access to safe water by using the Mesita Sul? And then uh, we develop a model to understand what are the main factors that are driving any contamination at the household level. Uh, we carried out our study in the Baja California Peninsula in northwest Mexico in 24 communities with about 440 households in total. Uh, we used a very rigorous uh, study design. It's called the Step Wedge Cluster Randomized Trial. And, and this is you know, similar to a randomized trial, but what, what in, the, in the sense that it creates a comparison group, and it creates that comparison group uh, randomly. So, so the comparison and the, the control group and the intervention are, are uh, created to be uh, balanced. And, but, but one of the key things here is that the rollout of the intervention uh, is done sequentially in different steps. And that was important because that's how you, usually the organization rolls out the program. And so we wanted to evaluate uh, this program in a similar way, which it gets done every day. And that way it would have more external validity. And, and so a couple of things to note here is that there was a baseline where water quality and other indicators were measured. And then in the first step, the intervention was promoted in four communities, and then there was another evaluation in all of the, there were visits in all of the communities. And then the, in the second step, four more houses received the intervention, and the, and the evaluation continued all the way until the 24 uh, communities had received the, the intervention. Um, we, we used E. coli as a, as a fecal indicator. And uh, particularly, we use IDEX's Colilert 18 and their most probable number, the uh, quantitary most probable number method. And we measured water quality at the drinking vessel. So we asked people to pour water in a glass that they usually, a glass or cup that they usually use for drinking purposes. 
And that's because we were interested in documenting water quality right before people drink it. And so what we found between the control group and, and, the, and the intervention was that uh, around 60% of the households in the control group had e the pres presence of E. coli and in their drinking vessels. And around 30% of the households uh, in, the, in the Mesita Sul program had presence of E. coli. So we saw the significant reduction, but we also found evidence of contamination, even when people were uh, disinfecting water with ultraviolet light and storing it in what we thought uh, was a safe storage container. Um, another thing to point out here is that most of the reduction in the presence of E. coli came from this high concentration, high, uh, medium and high concentrations of E. coli. So that's E. coli from this orange and red, like orange, between 10 and 100 uh, coliforming units, uh, colony forming units per 100 milliliters, and then the red one more than 100. To put this in context, uh, in parallel to the rural study, we carried out a, a study in an urban area nearby, and, and these are the results for pipe water, for the pipe water system, and these are the results for bottled water in 20 liter containers, which is really what most families are, are doing now in Mexico, at least in urban areas. They're purchasing bottled water because they don't trust their, their, their centralized systems. And, and these are the E. coli levels that we found. Um, the same, you know, uh, in this city, most of the bottling companies that supply the rural area where we did the study come from this same city. And, and what you can see from, you know, from the same bottled water in urban areas to rural areas was that there was an increase in contamination. And this is most likely due to the environment of a rural household and, and the hygiene conditions of a rural household. Again, it's important to note that these samples were collected at the drinking vessel. Um, and, and we also collected some samples of bottled water when the bottled water was new, it hadn't been open, and all of them were clean. So they were not coming from, uh, it's, it's con this contamination is not coming from, from the from bottom plants. It's, it's actually happening inside the house or at the glass. And here we see that the Mesita Sul uh, led to a result that it's equivalent to buying bottled water in, uh, from an urban area and bringing it to your home. And that's, you know, both, both of these uh, technologies use ultraviolet disinfection to in inactivate pathogens and they use the same storage container. And what's important to conclude about this is that transferring the responsibility from a technician that is trained and supervised in a water purification plant in an urban area to a household member through a UV disinfection system at the household did not lead to changes in the water contamination at the drinking vessel. And, and, and this is important because uh, the, the supply of bottled water to rural areas is sporadic. It's a very high cost for people in rural communities. And, and so, so we think that this is good evidence that, you know, although we see some contamination, the best practice that is being used in Mexico, which is to buy bottled water, uh, you know, lead to the same results as uh, having a UV disinfection system installed in the home. Uh, this graph follows the water quality uh, from the, you know, from collecting the sample uh, outside, right, uh, from the outlet of the UV disinfection system and then collecting the sample directly from the storage container and then through the drinking vessel. And so we see that there are some, there's some contamination coming out from the outlet. That's mostly because we ask use, users to operate the system and if they did not turn, off the, turn on the light or if they did something that was wrong, we didn't interfere, we just collected the sample. And um, so, so there's a little bit of contamination happening here, but most of the contamination is occurring in the storage container and then there's this additional like 10% contamination happening in the drinking vessel. And this, you know, this issue that we're finding with the drinking vessel is relevant to any household water treatment method, even chlorine, because the contact time in the drinking vessel is so short that uh, even chlorine would not be able to, uh, to de inactivate pathogens in there. So, so I think it's something uh, important to consider in household water treatment programs. Uh, then we developed this uh, model for water contamination in the home. Uh, we selected several stages of managing the water at the home that, that are think are, that could be affecting contamination like treatment, storage, extraction of the water, and washing, the like channel of washing the container, and all of that modulated by hygiene. And we decided to select this type of um, uh, processes because these are processes that can be affected by a safe water program uh, as opposed to developing a model that relies on the income of the household members or the level of education, which is usually outside of the scope of a water program. And and also provides more evidence of where the water program, what are the strengths and weaknesses of a water program, and then uh, you should use, uh, hopefully use that information to improve 
uh, water programs. So what we found, this is, this is a, a, a table that has a lot of information, but we try to follow it from the process, like washing, we select the two independent variables, like, you know, is disinfected water being used during the washing process, is bleach and soap being used in the washing process. And we found that for washing, these variables were not associated with the presence of E. coli. And that's even considering that only 20%, around 20% of the families use disinfected water to wash their containers. We think that it's not associated because there might be a dilution effect and the, the concentration of E. coli initially on raw water, on untreated water, was not very high. Uh, but, but we cannot claim that washing is not important. There might be some areas where, or, or there might be other pathogens that come in higher concentrations and, and they could still be present. Uh, however, it was clear that the process of treatment was uh, uh, associated with the presence of E. coli in the sense that if the system was not working, like only 3% of the systems were not working, then the probability of finding E. coli was much, was much higher. One useful area, though, was you know, they, we evaluated how good the operators were at using this technology. And in our category of being an expert, which meant like not making no mistakes and doing the process really easily without doubt, uh, only 30% of the operators met this category. And if your household had an operator like this, you had about 40% less chances of finding E. coli on the water. So that's, that was an important result that we can act upon in our program. Uh, contrary to what we had hypothesized initially, you know, uh, increasing the time of storage led to a reduction of, of E. coli on the water. And yes, we don't know exactly why that could be happening. And I mean, it could be because of die-off. The die-off was a more important uh, mechanism than contamination. Um, and also in, in, a, in the extraction uh, criteria, uh, increasing the number of extractions, whether with a pump or tilting the container or opening a spigot, Increasing those extractions also decreased the contamination, uh, which was contrary to what we had hypothesized initially. Here we believe that there might be some settling of the E. coli, and then uh, and so initially through the pumps and the spigot, which are the bottom, extract water from the bottom, you might have higher concentrations at the beginning, and then later on less concentration. And and then also we found that there was no difference between the different extraction methods that we used, uh, but using a drinking vessel. Uh, really double the, the chances of finding E. coli in the water. And, and also, there was a hygiene variable that was uh, statistically significantly associated to the, um, to the presence of E. coli. And that was, you know, if you had an improved household infrastructure, which meant like concrete floors and walls, the probability of finding E. coli was about 60% less than if you didn't have that. But uh, hygiene in the kitchen and having a dedicated hand washing station were not associated. So moving uh, into the adoption and sustained use evaluation, and here I'm gonna go a little bit faster, but we, we were really interested in understanding what uh, affects adoption and what, what levels of adoption and sustained use can be achieved by the program. And so we developed a compliance framework to map key household uh, water treatment outcomes. Uh, for example, uh, you can th think of knowledge of a safe water practice, access to safe water, the habit of safe water practice, and then the exclusive use of safe water. And you can see that how they get, as, as you go down, they get stricter and stricter, which is what you want to get if you want to have a health impact. And so for each of these, uh, we disaggregated the household in two types of members, those that operate uh, the system or those that procure, the, are in charge of procuring the safe water, and the rest of the household members, which are just consumers of that water. And then, for example, uh, concentrating on the habit of a safe water practice, we map that to the Mesita Sul program and for procuring, like, you know, for operating the Mesita Sul, you know, to be able to have a habit of a safe water practice, we chose an indicator which was that they would use the Mesita Sul at least every five days. And, and for the habit of consuming safe water, uh, that had to be, you know, people had to report that their most common source of water was water treated with UV and safely stored, but also their last glass of water had to come from from there. So we would, you know, to have a more objective metric, we will ask them, you know, do you remember the last glass of water that you drank? And they would say, yes, I remember that glass, last glass of water. And so you will take them to a very specific point in time, and then you will ask them, so where did, that, where did you serve that last glass of water? And, but we did something similar to all of the other uh, outcomes. And so what we find, let's, we can think first of 
of the habit of consuming safe water, which was our initial goal, we found that the Mesitazol program increased uh, the, con the habit of consuming safe water from 20% to 50%. And this 20% was mostly households using bottled water. And, and then here in the intervention, uh, there was actually a reduction on the consumption of bottled water from 20% to 10%, and then uh, about 40% of the families had the habit of consuming water from the UV system. And what it's important to know about the other metrics is that you, there's this downward tendency. And, and so the Mesitasul program uh, reached a very high adoption, about 90%, uh, but as it, we went into knowledge, access, and habit, and exclusive use, that, uh, that went down. And the other important thing to note here is that usually the metrics that are uh, for the metrics that are for the person that operates the system or that procures the safe water are usually higher than the metrics that are used for the people that consume the water. And that might reflect, the f and, and that was not the case necessarily for, um, uh, for, for consuming bottled water. And that might reflect that in our program we emphasize more activities for those that operate the system and not so much for those that are consuming safe water. So in conclusion, Households did gain access to safe water by using the Mesita Sul, but there's definitely the potential for larger gains. I mean, we still saw a lot of uh, samples contaminated with E. coli, and we were not expecting that, and we would like to reduce that. Uh, we have, you know, by doing the, the, the model, we know that now that we can concentrate on treating more operators, on training more operators, uh, or training better the operators so that uh, they can, and that we hope that that will reduce contamination, we have to think more about how to improve the hygiene on drinking vessels, and, and there's something to be done about the hygiene of the households as well. And in terms of adoption, uh, yes, it, you know, household uh, UV disinfection uh, did lead to higher adoption rates than, than boiling, chlorine, and even bottled water, which is a preferred option in Mexico. Uh, but still, you know, we saw a drop in sustained use and exclusive use that, that we didn't want to see. And so that really has challenged, you know, to the you know, final conclusion is that that has really challenged the way that we were seeing our safe, our household water treatment program. And initially, as most household water treatment programs, it was conceived as a, being a product-based program in a sense that you have a product that you bring into a house, you train people to operate it and maintain it, but then you leave and although you might do some follow-ups, uh, you transfer all these responsibilities. You know, sometimes we like to say that we're transferring, that we're empowering people with a household water treatment system, but we're also transferring a series of responsibilities that we usually don't have when we are drinking water from the tap. And, and so what, what is happening here is that, you know, most households have access, we're, we're able to gain access to safe water, uh, and, and they had water readily available at any time that we will visit them. And they're consuming from that water, but they're also drinking, you know, from other area, all sources that they have at home. And that's uh, because point of use treatment is not treating all of the other sources that are available at home. And, and so we thought of two different approaches to deal with this problem. And one is to, you know, m one has to do more with infrastructure and it's to move from point of use to point of entry in the sense, you know, to treat all the water that comes into the house and to safely store all the water that comes into the house. But that would require a higher capital investment and it would be really difficult to replicate this. And the other approach is to, you know, if we were successful at increasing access to safe water, then let's just focus on changing habits of the consumers. Uh, but that also requires a lot of interaction in the communities, and it's really difficult to finance as well. Um, so what we are trying now, uh, in the past month, we implemented 200 uh, Mesitas Azules in, in a region in Chiapas. Now we're working in South Mexico. And, and we, we're changing this paradigm from a product-based program to a service-based program. So instead of asking people to pay one-time fee for, for our product, we're asking them to enroll into, this, into a service and make monthly payments. And the idea of these monthly payments is that, at the very least, they can be used to sustain uh, a group of staff that, that, uh, create, that helps address the technical issues that might exist in the house, but most importantly, that helps drive uh, behavior change. And that's where we are now. So I finally, I, mean, I would like to thank my colleagues in UC Berkeley and Fundación Cantar Azul and, and the entities also in Berkeley in Mexico that have supported our work.
interesting things out of that. So hopefully we get some good questions here tomorrow. So we did, I mean, as part of that study, we measured health outcomes. We found a 20% reduction in diarrhea disease, in like seven day recall, but we had a relatively small sample and so it was not statistically significant. It's, so we are hoping to do a larger study. It was, this was the first study that we did and it's usually seen as a pilot study of, uh, uh, you know, of, of measuring health outcomes and then the idea is to do a larger one that has enough power to uh, to have a conclusion on that. No, you know, the, the initial response was very good. Like we, we achieved, I mean, we promoted the program to the whole population in these communities and 90, you know, about 80% of them, the rest uh, were using about bottled water, but uh, about 80% of them ended up paying a fee and acquiring a, a Mesita Azul. So the, the response was, was really good. And uh, I mean, the program was subsidized, but families had to pay about pr approximately $20 for, you know, to participate in the program. and and. I think, I mean, I, I can remember uh, stories where, like, we were bringing a Mesita Azul to a household that had been enrolled, and then the, the, the man, the, the, uh, the one of the men in the house came out and said, well, you know, we don't have a lot of money, we prefer not to participate. And we pull out the Mesita Azul outside of the cardboard box, and the woman really liked it, and she came out, and, you know, she basically sent the man inside the house, and she, you know, she paid the uh, $20, and she got it. So, so you know, it, it, it does, I mean, it, it, it was a system that, that it was designed to, to, to look attractive for, for rural users and, and it doesn't have like a heavy burden in using it. In, in using it. So, so there was no negative reaction at the beginning. It's more this, you're confronting a challenge that people have drank untreated water for generations and it's water that looks clear, it doesn't look turbid. And, and so they, I mean, the, the main issue that we have is that they're drinking, say, water from the Mesita Sul, but they're also drinking untreated water. And I think that's the main uh, limitation that we have. But, but we have gone through a lot of hurdles that many other household water treatment programs have not been able to cross yet. Um, untreated water. So like the... Like this one, for example, is used for uh, washing dishes. And you know, I, I don't have one here, but for washing clothes and hands, usually untreated water as well. The, the what is the drinking vessel, the cup, has been washed with untreated water. I, I think there's a mix. There, there's a mix. Some some families uh, wash them with disinfected water, but uh, if you remember, only 20% of the families, although we told them to wash the the storage containers, yeah. even before the drinking vessel, the storage containers with disinfected water, only 20% of the families reported doing that. Uh, most of them still wash them with untreated, uh, with untreated water. And that's, I, I mean, that, those are spaces, you know, to, I mean, there are definitely families that are using this water for cooking and for washing vegetables. vegetables. But as far as washing hands, I don't think that it gets that far. Although, although one of the nice things about UV disinfection is that, I mean, this same system, the same UV chamber, we use it for schools and for communities. You see them here, and it can produce so much more water. So, so it's not, once you have a UV system at home, the marginal costs of producing more water are ne negligible. So, so these are things that can be incorporated into the program. Can we take? Yeah, sure. So the lamp is a 15 watt lamp. If you add that the ballast is not 100% efficient, maybe it's consuming about 20 watts for five minutes a day. Uh, I mean, it's, it's like one kilowatt hour, if I remember correctly, it's one or two kilowatt hours a year, which is, is a very small amount of money. Like people don't, even, even in the households that had solar panels that only power 
a couple of lamps, they, they didn't notice that the system was depleting their, their energy. So, so the energy consumption is not, is not, I mean, it's a problem if you don't have access to it, but once you have access, it's not a problem. I noticed that the quality right out of the system is really good, and then the next step in the quality is getting poorer. So in your s storage container, it looks like it has a narrow neck, but what's cause what do you think is causing the uh, the contamination there? Is I, I know. I mean, this, this is the, I mean, I think everyone would call this a safe storage container yeah. in comparison to other containers yeah, that people use. You can't put your hand in. You can't. But uh, what, what is causing it, I mean, it's just, I mean, look at the household. Most of them have dirt floors, they have chickens running around, and, and so it's, I think it's really the environmental conditions, and, and yes, I mean, it's hard. It's, it's hard. I'm really curious about your mo moving to a service-based model as well. Um, what's the cost of the service? So if it's, say, $20, $30 for the system to buy, and then you walk away and they take care of it, if you provide a service, mm -hmm. are you employing somebody? Is somebody yes. getting paid to go around? What, what's the model there, and what are your initial thoughts on mm -hmm. that being more sustainable than your... So, so we have Other design, ones. I mean, we're, we're focused on working on rural communities and, and the problem there is that they're very cash constrained. So we, we develop a, a, a center actually in partnership with a, 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 with a social business that works on, on solar electricity. And, and so we are uh, launching this center where uh, as technicians are gonna go to rural communities and install them as the and offer them through a service model. And they're gonna be charging around four US dollars per month and, and that is going to finance everything. Uh, I mean, it will take us around five years to recover all the costs, including the infrastructure of the center, uh, but, but it will finance everything. And that's, I mean, it, it seems a little bit high, but comparison, I mean, <coughs> buying 20 liters of bottled water costs about a dollar. So, so it's a much better alternative for those that are buying bottled water. The, the challenge is to get to those that are not buying bottled water right now. And in, in we are working in other regions with more, uh, with, indigenous population that, that don't have that access to $5 a month. And in those cases, we need to partner with foundations or the government. Mm -hmm. And in, in, one, in the case that I mentioned, we're charging a dollar a month, and that's enough to sustain a local staff uh, to provide that service. It's not covering the cost of the organization, but it's covering the, the cost of the staff. Awesome. Okay. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Excellent talk.